Hello, and welcome back to Eric Likes Animals podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mahan, and I'm here to chat with you guys about some environmental news stories and, of course, some animals. So if this is your first time hanging out with me, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back and thanks for listening. So why don't we get started first with some environmental news. So the first article I'm going to read and talk to you guys about today is one reported by Live Science, and it is called One of the Longest Dino Tracks in the World Revealed by the Drought in Texas State Park. So this article goes in to talk about that there was at least one positive thing about the droughts that are happening out west, and it is revealing all these amazing, pristine dinosaur footprints never before seen. Now the article goes on to say, An ongoing drought has revealed about 70 dinosaur tracks at Dinosaur Valley State Park in Glen Rose, Texas. The footprints, which date back about 110 million years, have been hidden underwater and mud in a river which cuts through the state park. Experts think that the tracks found in what is known as the state park's ballroom site belong to two different species of dinosaurs. The three-toed tracks were likely from a giant carnivore, and excuse me as I butcher these dinosaur names because I am definitely not a paleontologist, Acryocanthosaurus, while the elephant-looking footprints were stomped into the ground by a massive long neck Seraposidon. Once again, a paleontologist probably butchered them. The predator dinosaur was one of North America's largest predators during the early Cretaceous period, about 145 million to 101 million years ago, and it had a length of about 40 feet or 12 meters. However, the long-necked Seraposidon, a genus of the seropod, dwarfed it, stretching approximately 100 feet or 30 meters long and weighing a whopping 110,000 pounds or 50 metric tons, according to the Natural History Museum in London. Now, A very cool article, I must say. Still, don't think that droughts are worth seeing dinosaur footprints, especially for those of you that live out west probably are agreeing with me on this. But it's at least still not all negative that all these droughts are happening out there. At least we get to see cool dinosaur footprints. Next up, another ancient animal story, once again reported by Live Science. 3,000-year-old mummified bees are so well-preserved, scientists can see the flowers the insects ate. I know we all think of the mosquitoes, of course, getting preserved in the amber thanks to Jurassic Park, but this is for the first time I feel like I've ever heard about bees being found kind of fully intact and having nothing to do with amber being involved. Getting into the article itself, it goes on to say, Thousands of years ago, a group of adolescent bees became trapped in cocoons inside their nest and left behind a remarkably preserved record of their mummified remains. Researchers in Portugal reported the discovery of the ancient insects and fossilized bees' nests, the first to be found with bees preserved in it, that is, in a study published by July 27th in the Journal of Papers in Paleontology. This new fossil site is a remarkable opportunity to better understand bee nesting behaviors and their evolution because we can be face-to-face with the users of these nests, led the study author Carlos, a paleontologist at the Global Geopark in Portugal, told by Live Science in an email. The bees were found in rocks that formed about 3,000 years ago near the Atlantic coast of Portugal. The researchers had found fossils of bulb-shaped objects that they identified as traces of ancient cocoons. Because these kinds of burrows could have been dug by many kinds of bees or wasps, however, the researchers assume they've never known what created the objects. This is until they found some intact, sealed cocoons. By scanning these samples, this team could see the remains of the ancient bees hidden inside the cocoons, looking remarkably under-deformed for having sat underground for thousands of years. The specimens are intact enough that researchers place them in the tribe of Eucerian, a group of bees that often have exceptionally long antennae. The specimens also contain evidence of pollen from various plants revealing what these bees may have eaten. 
These bees lay their eggs in underground nests, where over time their spawn spin cocoons as they develop and grow into adult bees before emerging above ground. But these individuals were killed before they reached that stage, and killed in a way that might have led to their exceptional preservation. The researchers speculated that all the bees died at once, potentially by a sudden freeze or by flooding and subsequent burial. These conditions could have created a mini environment around the bees without oxygen, which could have kept away bacteria that would usually be the thing that breaks down insects' bodies after they die. So, wow. <laughs> Just wow, right? So, in my mind, it almost sounds like these bees kind of got vacuum sealed in by nature, which then, of course, held off the bacteria and kept them well preserved up to 3,000 years. Still relatively fresh, honestly. And that is just such a cool thing, especially since, as I said at the beginning, we always think that insects' preservation can only come from amber sealing them in. So it's really cool to see another opportunity and also to dive more into the past and what these animals were doing that then led to our modern-day animals. And then finally, reported by The Guardian, scientists have made some new discoveries, and the article title is... Seven New Walking Leaf Insect Species Discovered. Now, this is a shorter article, but still very exciting to know that scientists have discovered, or in this case, identified, differences in animals to classify them enough into new species, which in the long run can help with funding. If what was thought to be one species ends up being seven, and one of those seven is not doing so well, it can help those individuals then get the help that they need. Now, the article goes on to say seven new leaf insect species known as walking leaves have been discovered. The insects exhibit a sophisticated twig or leaf-like camouflage, allowing them to blend into their surroundings without detection, posing a challenge to both predators and researchers. Historically, taxonomically, the sorting and classification of these species has been difficult with the insects that cannot be identified based on external appearances alone. The new study published in the journal Zookeys used genetic analysis to identify the species. Some insects found in India have been previously been assumed to be part of a large Southeast Asian species group. Now, these individuals of different species are often counted as belonging to the same species based on their appearance. We were only able to identify some of the new species by their genetic characteristics, explained lead researcher Dr. Sarah Bank Alden of the University of <laughs> Sorry, going to butcher this, gotten gin in Germany. Co-author Dr. Sven Bradler, also at the university, added there are around 3,500 known species of stick and leaf insects, and there are currently just over 100 described species of leaf insects. Although they only make up a small fraction of this diverse family of insects, their spectacular unexpected appearance makes them unique. Now, the findings are important not only for this systematic study of leaf insects, but also for the protection of their diversity. The loss of these Indian insects would not merely reduce numbers within a known species, it would mean the extinction of an entirely separate species. The importance of biodiversity preservation, said Dr. Banks, the finding is important for species conservation. If all individuals die out in India, it is not just a group within a species that is reduced, as was previously thought. In fact, a whole distinct species is being wiped out. This means that the Indian species is particularly important to protect. And that is your environmental news. So, on to the creature feature today. Today's featured creature is an animal I have personally worked with pretty much my entire professional career. And I actually have had the privilege of working with a number of different individuals and is definitely a personal favorite of mine. One of the first species I ever kind of did a project around. And this amazing animal that I'm going to talk to you guys about today is the burrowing owl. Now, the burrowing owl lives in deserts, plains, and fields of western North America, along with the drier regions of Central and South America. Burrowing owls found in cooler areas may spend their winters in southwestern United States. There is also, of course, a population found in Florida and was actually the main focal point in a mystery novel I always loved as a kid called Hoot, a fantastic book for younger and, yes, even older readers, and they even made a movie based off of it. But the book is always still a little more fun to read. 
As for the size of the barang owl, they are one of the smallest owl species, and unlike many other owl species where females are larger than the males, the barang owl it has both sex being similar size, or if anything, the male actually might be slightly larger, but not that large, because they can only reach about 9 inches or 23 centimeters in height. As for weight, they're only a little around 4 to 7 ounces or 113 to 198 grams. And in the wild, they can only live about six to eight years. But I can say, since I worked with so many of them in captivity, they do live a bit longer in captivity. Now, as for the looks, burrowing owls have a short, square tail, long and slender legs. Burrowing owls spend a lot of time on the ground, mind you, so they need these legs for running. So it almost looks like someone stuck kind of roadrunner legs on them, but that's just because both species of the birds may be able to fly but spend a lot more time on the ground so these kind of long skinny legs help them move quickly about and keep their body higher off the ground so their feathers don't get all torn up as they walk about. Now if those legs don't catch your attention right away possibly their bright yellow eyes will perfect for looking across vast open prairies or deserts. The burrowing owl has a round head and lacks ear tufts which makes sense since many of the species of owls use those for camouflage and they're not actually ears, they're not for hearing. The tufts help them look like bark on a tree as they sit on it, but since burrowing owls don't live in trees very often and are down in the ground and in the dirt, it makes sense that they don't have ear tufts, but they do have pale brown plumage spotted and barred with white markings so that they match the soil that they live in. And when I say live in, I mean literally, because burrowing owls are named that because they literally live in burrows in the ground versus making a nest in a tree or a cactus. This may seem strange, but this gives the burrowing owl the ability to live in areas where many owls cannot due to the lack of vegetation or plants to build nests in. Burrowing owls will use old burrows from other animals such as prairie dogs or in Florida the gopher tortoise, but they can dig their own and no matter what, they still have to do some remodeling when they first move in, no matter what. So if they do take a used home, they do have to make a new one, sort of with some assembly required. In fact, a burrowing owl's average nest size is about 6 to 10 feet long burrow tunnel that leads down to a nest chamber. Now the burrows stay a little cooler being down in the ground, so it's a very nice way to get away from the heat or the midday sun. But for the most part, unlike other owl species, the burrowing owl are diurnal, aka they're awake during the day. A lot of time they're spotted at the entrance of their burrows looking across the vast openness, possibly looking out for threats. If they do spot one, they normally start to bop up and down, almost looking like they are bowing. In fact, cowboys back in the day used to call them howdy birds because they thought it looked like they were nodding hello as they came by. But in reality, what they're doing a lot of time is they're bopping up and down and sending out alarm calls to make sure that other owls around the area know that they have spotted danger. Now, if the danger does persist still, they will entirely lay really flat to the ground. Or if they're near the burrow, they will run back inside. And only at the very last second, if they have to, they can fly away too, of course. Now, the threats that come after burrowing owls in the wild are a variety. Badgers, foxes, skunks, coyotes, weasels, raccoons, and snakes to name a few. But don't feel bad for this little owl. Besides running away, it of course has some sharp talons, a beak, and can puff up really big to kind of throw off the possible predators that they are much bigger and not as easy of a meal especially when they throw up those wings. And bonus, if they go down into their burrow, Burrowing owls have the unique ability to make rattlesnake sounds. So especially with younger burrowing owls where they may stay in the burrow more often and a potential predator like a fox comes upon the burrow and he sniffs out and smells some really yummy little owls or owlets down there and decides to start digging, well, the owls down there will start to make a call that mimics the sound of a rattlesnake rattle, thus stopping the fox or any other predator digging because... Well, very few out there would ever try and tangle with a big diamondback rattlesnake. Now, speaking of snakes, by the way, the big ones can be dangerous to the owls, but the smaller ones, well, they make a fantastic meal. Burrowing owl diets include small birds, reptiles, fish, rodents, and large insects. 
They may even hover above the ground in search of prey or hunt from a perch. They are also fairly good flyers for not doing it too often and are able to catch insects on the fly. Now, as for reproduction and breeding season, it varies a bit based on the location of the burrowing owl, but for the most part, courtships can start anywhere from April to March for the burrowing owl. And they will normally pair up for life, so the first year that they can breed, you better make a good impression because, well, you're stuck for life with them. It may vary a bit a lot of times, but for the most part, the male will normally set up a good burrow, possibly showing off his potential for a future family. Hopefully it's in a, a good location, of course, close to lots of food and doesn't flood when the rains come. But there is more that goes into it than just being a hole in the ground. He may start trying to decorate it with dry grasses and other plants, of course, but more importantly, he will also decorate it with things like poop and dead carcasses. He will try to cover it with things like bison poop and leftover food bits, and it looks and probably smells disgusting to us, but more importantly, looking and thank goodness they don't have much of ability to smell, looks good for them. When a female does come by, he may fly up and hover, descending, trying to show off his strength and endurance. He may also try and feed and preen her, all of which is to show that he will be a suitable mate and can clearly feed and constantly fly around gathering resources for both of them and of course their offspring in the future. Because no one wants a lazy male who won't pull their own weight in the relationship. Now if she likes him and the nest she will stay and they will mate. And they will have possibly around anywhere from you know 3 to 12 eggs. Yep you heard me correctly 12 eggs, which is a lot for a little owl, especially since most of the time they will hatch in only 28 to 30 days. And during that time of incubation, it's normally the females that stays down in the burrow tending to the eggs and making sure the humidity and temperature stays just right for the eggs to hatch. While she is doing this, the male will, of course, be out catching food for her and bringing anything else she may need during this time. Now, when they do hatch, it's all hands, or in this case, wings, on deck, because there are now tons of mouths to feed. Both parents will go out and literally try to catch as much food as possible, and they will do okay even though, unlike many other owl species, burrowing owls are known to live in close proximity to each other, which is perfect since prairie dog towns abandoned normally can have multiple pairs setting up because you don't want to let all those good burrows go to waste. Now, even though all those pairs can literally have piles of babies that they have to feed, they only are two little owls each feeding all of those babies. But luckily, that's where all the poop and carcasses was for in their nest building. Yep, it actually does serve a purpose, and that purpose is to attract insects. They create a literal insect oasis, or at least on the surface it would seem like that, because then tons of food in a nice cool place to get away for the sun is everything an insect wants. And all those insects living in the burrow means a constant flow of food for the baby's owl who can literally feed themselves because their house is covered in food. It would be like if your house was just covered in pizza constantly. Now they can't really move too well when they're first born but eventually will start looking like mini versions of the adults but with little to no bar patterns across them and are more just solid colors of brown, which once again makes sense because at their age, they're kind of going in and out of the burrow a little bit, but normally don't stay too far from it. And they're only out there to kind of build up their wing muscles a little bit. But since they're kind of closer to the burrow entrance and it's really just dirt right around there, they're going to mimic more kind of just that solid brown pattern that you would see there. But in about 40 days or about six weeks, they will fledge and leave their nest. And as early as the following summer, but more likely two summers, they will begin to start looking more like an adult and they will then find their own mate to build a burrow and cover it in shit. Now, as for their conservation, the IUCN Red List has them listed as least concerned population decreasing with a variety of threats for them. First, we of course have climate change with the increase of fires and droughts, there is less vegetation. And we've touched on climate change a lot, so you know, save water, stop producing so much carbon dioxide because more fires and less rain. 
means there's less food in general for the Barongao food to eat because less animals means less poop, which means less insects for baby food. You also, of course, have human development destroying the environment to add housing, manufacturing, and golf courses, and so on. With all these comes things, of course, like poison, where humans will try to kill the insects, mice, and anything else they don't want near their house and put a lot of chemicals down, which intend to kill the animals right away. But a lot of animals don't die right away, and things then get eaten by other animals. So you could have a toxic insect that then the burrowing owl will eat and then become poisoned themselves. And then finally, like I said, many burrowing owls can dig their own burrows, but many rely on other animals like prairie dogs and gopher tortoises. And gopher tortoises, for example, are severely under threat. And even though prairie dogs are coming back, they were devastated for years from ranchers wiping out millions of prairie dogs with poison because the holes the prairie dogs created were tripping hazards for cattle. And because the cattle would trip in them, they would literally break their legs and the rancher would lose prized cattle. So it was hurting their livelihood. Luckily, however, I said they, the prairie dogs are coming back because many people realize what a major keystone species prairie dogs are. So the government and locals have set up many different strategies to keep them protected. But what else can we do? One is many groups set up artificial nesting sites where people build artificial burrows for burrowing out. Plus, humans, when they build these burrows, can normally then make sure that these burrows are put in safe less trafficked human areas so that the owls can have a nice, safe, and peaceful area to relax and set up a whole family. Plus, burrowing owls that use the nests can more easily be monitored for research and help ID how the population is doing. And of course, many zoological facilities help with breeding programs that they will work with a variety of government agencies to help the wild population and of course are part of some release programs. Now, to help out the gopher tortoises in Florida, they still have some work there, but they are trying to conserve the gopher tortoise habitat, which not only helps bring an important keystone species back for the burrowing owl, but also saves the burrowing owl habitats as well. By the way, I just realized I don't think I ever explained keystone species before, and it's an important thing to know since I keep using that vocabulary. So a keystone is an important stone in building an old stone archway. It is the one at the very top that sort of keeps it all together when you look at it for support. So this is used to describe certain animals that are more integrated into the food web than others. After all, all animals are part of the food web, but some have more connections within the food web than others, which means they are affecting a wider variety of animals, whether positive or negative in the food web, than certain other animals. So kind of like that keystone in the archway, if it were to disappear, very likely you then have the whole archway to fall apart. Because without that certain species, the ecosystem in general could fall apart because each of those stones leading up to that so-called keystone in the archway represents different animals and different parts of the ecosystem, all of which is important to create this archway, but the collapse of the keystone species leads to the rest falling apart. So yeah, that's what a keystone species is. And as for the rest, of what we can do, learning to live with animals, of course, and finding more natural ways to deal with possible pest problems, and just remembering that, well, when you move into a house or build a new house on land, many other creatures that have been living there already, and that you should actually encourage certain animals to move into your backyard to deal with the ones that you don't want, like certain types of insects or mice. For example, encouraging birds like swallows that love insects or birds of prey with nest boxes can help eat mice and insects that you don't want in your own backyard instead of using toxic sprays and all that. Nature literally provides you with its own pest control system. And another good pest control animal, which a lot of people might not like, but they are vitally important, is snakes. Setting up snake habitats or burrow spots around your area with certain plants depending on your region, can encourage snakes to come in and help take care of a lot of pests. And if you're worried about venomous snakes, depending on your area, 
they first off are always more scared of you than you are of them and normally most venomous snakes do like really pristine habitats so if you're in a cul-de-sac or something that's a little rarer to see them but if you are scared of venomous snakes coming in you can always encourage things like king snakes to come in which aren't venomous snakes but actually their main diet is venomous snakes hence the name king snake they are eaters of snakes plus bonus if you have a bunch of baby snakes that are in your backyard that is a delicious snack for burrowing owls and all of this plus all these other little things can help protect the habitat that these little owls live in and thus saving the amazing burrowing owl And that's that show. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the burrowing owl. As always, make sure to check me out on my social media pages, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Or if you want to just send me an email, you can always email me at ericlikesanimals at gmail.com. Links will be provided below in the episode footer. Also, there is still time for a Blue Loops 50 Most Influencer Award for Zoo and Aquarium peeps. So if you have someone to nominate, you can check out the link also below in the footer while it's still open. And that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I'll see you all next time.